didn't we have a great camp meeting? We thank the Lord for it. We've been getting so many emails uh, from people that have gotten back and then emails and the calls that came in today of people that watched it telling us how blessed they were, how they sensed the spirit of the Lord. Got so many testimonies that came in of those that got filled with the Holy Spirit while they were here. And so we just give uh, the Lord all the praise and glory. We're going to be doing for the next for the next four Wednesday nights, all the Wednesday nights of this month, we're going to be studying the little book of Jude. And uh, uh, I was reading and studying on this the other day and... One commentator, speaking of this book, said that Jude was the most neglected book of the New Testament. I don't know why that statement was made, because it is a powerful, powerful book. So we're going to be studying this the next four Wednesday nights. And Dr. Dupree is with us. That We've had a, a rash of illness going around, so we're a little short tonight. But Dr. Dupree is here, and Gabe, and of course, Brother Lauren. And Lauren, that was a great way to end camp meeting. I'm Thank so you. glad you were led by the Holy Spirit to minister on the Holy Spirit Sunday night. And it just, to me, it just put the little bow on the whole meeting. Gabriel, you read uh, the, con- the notes I mean, the uh, verse, and I'll read the notes. Let's just read the first two verses. And we're not going to be able to spend uh, an an inordinate amount of time on every single verse because there's 25 verses in this book. But we're going to deal with the more salient passages, spend more time on those. Go ahead. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James... Jude was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ as well. To them who are sanctified by, the, by God the Father. Should have been translated to them who are loved by God the Father. And preserved in Jesus Christ. In effect, says God the Father is keeping the saints guarded by Jesus Christ. And called. The idea, as presented here by the Holy Spirit through Jude is that God does not want to lose the people he has called to be his own through false doctrine. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. All of this is made possible by the cross and the cross alone. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. And Lord, we ask for your help tonight as we open up This great book, the book of Jude, help us to articulate that which we need to say. And let it be a blessing to the hearts of everyone. And our only desire is that when we finish, that those that are able to watch will have an understanding of the importance of this little book. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said, Amen. As, as we said in the notes, Jude was the half-brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. There has been debate on why that uh, he did not identify himself as such. But uh, if you notice, if you read, when you read the book of James, James, his biological brother, another half-brother of the Lord, also did the same thing. He didn't identify himself as uh, the brother of the Lord Jesus. And there has been speculation, but more than likely the reason why that Jude identified himself as only the brother of James and as a servant of, of the Lord Jesus Christ is because we know from Scripture that uh, the Lord who had, what was it, four brothers? At least four brothers. At least four brothers and several sisters. Seven, yes. And you can read that in Matthew chapter, I think it's 13. 13.55. Mar- 13.55 and Mark chapter 6 as well. And, uh, and, and they did not follow the Lord in his earthly ministry. The evidence is that it wasn't until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ that they surrendered their life to him. And as such, more than, not, more than likely, there was some shame in their own heart that they did not walk with the Lord, they did not serve him, they didn't believe him. They actually thought he was mad, that he had lost his mind. 
But the resurrection cured all of that. Mm -hmm. And they came to the Lord. And of course, James became the pastor of the mother church in Jerusalem, came to be known as James the Just. And then Jude, his half-brother. The word servant there is the Greek word doulos, and it means bond slave. So in essence, Jude is saying, I am a bond slave of Jesus Christ. And that is the appellative that every single child of God should walk under. We are to be servants, to be bond slaves of Jesus Christ. And uh, to them who are sanctified by God the Father, you read the note, should have been translated to them who are loved by God, preserved in Christ and called. Now, the second verse is what I want to jump to real quickly. Three things he brings out, mercy, peace, and love. The word mercy here, and we've brought it out in sermons and in teaching before, mercy is a derivative of grace. When God long before this world was ever created, before man was ever created. When knowing in his foreknowledge that man would fall, he determined that he was going to deal with all of humanity on the basis of grace. And by such deciding to do that, he has no choice but to show mercy. And if you want an idea, a definition of this word mercy, and gentlemen, y'all may have a better definition, but the best that I can find is mercy, as it means here, is the pity of God given to undeserving humans. As grace is the goodness of God given to undeserving humans, mercy is his pity. He looked down upon us, and he saw us, and he had pity on us in our lost condition, but there's a difference between the human pity that we have for one another and godly pity. In our pity, we can only feel sorry. Mm -hmm. right. But in God's pity, he can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And he did something about it by sending his son, Jesus Christ. You and, know, real quick, that's the difference, and you hit on that, and I believe that uh, we should just deal with that just a little bit longer. The fact that God did something about it. Mm -hmm. He didn't just feel sorry for us in a sense of saying, well, I'm sorry this happened to you. But he did something about the problem at hand. And that is, of course, Calvary. And I think that all of us need to have an understanding of God's mercy. We sing that song, His Grace and Mercy uh, brought me through. And one of the things about mercy that's so important, is it's, it's an upward look from the human. We're looking up for help. We're looking up for something. We're looking up for an extended hand. God is looking down, down. not just to extend a hand, but to do something and to help us out of that. And the beautiful thing about this is that his mercy is new every morning. That's right. Mm -hmm. oh, and another word that might be added to it is compassion. Yes. Uh, and it's literally what Gabriel has said, active pity. And compassion isn't just, I feel sorry for you, but he extended that sense of feel towards humanity through his son. So it's active. There's a, there's a, a mercy that doesn't just feel pity for someone, but... As we've said, it has compassion and moves towards the individual to resolve the problem. You know, this idea that so, some, unfortunately, in the church has presented of our Heavenly Father as a vengeful God who is in heaven wanting to pour out wrath and judgment. And, of course, there is wrath and judgment to come for those who won't accept him. But that is a terrible presentation of God. God is merciful. And we need to understand that he loves us. I mean, every morning when we get up, we should be in awe of the fact that in spite of all of our problems, he loves us. Yes. And because of his love for us, there is mercy there. When we mess up, and we all mess up, we will all, look, we are an accident waiting to happen. We're a failure waiting to happen. But in our failure, God is not looking to squash us and to punish us. But he loves us. And he wants to show mercy. Of course, it is incumbent upon us when we fail the Lord to immediately repent. 
and ask the Lord to forgive us. And the moment we do, his mercy is new every morning. You cannot, over, there, there is nothing we can do that can short, uh, that can, that can stop the flow of mercy except not asking for help, Amen. not asking for forgiveness. Well, mercy, and I like that term compassion. It's God showing compassion to people who didn't deserve it to take care of what we can't do ourselves. There are too many people who have a picture of God who's sitting in heaven waiting to punish, looking for an opportunity to punish. And that's not how we should view God. We should view God as a compassionate Father who loved us so much that he gave the greatest gift that he had, his son Christ Jesus. And as he is merciful to us, so too, as children of God, are we to be merciful mm -hmm. to other brothers and sisters. Yeah. I remember several years ago, uh, I was invited to a pastor's conference. This was in the late 90s, so it's been a long time ago. And uh, I was in, it was a, a pastor's conference, and there would probably be about 2,000 pastors in this conference in Orlando. And the gentleman, that, the, the group that put it on, they had a special dinner the night before it was to start for the officers of this organization. And I don't even remember who it was, to be honest with you. And, and, and they invited me, even though I, they just you know, invited me to the conference and, and they invited me to this dinner. So I came in and I didn't hardly know anybody there. And I was sitting down and, and I was trying to figure, I knew you know, just a, three or four people out of a, maybe a hundred in there. But across the, uh, on the other side of the room in a round table, was setting a young man and his wife. He was, had been the youth pastor at one of the largest independent charismatic churches in Atlanta, Georgia, that came out of the Church of God. You probably know who I'm talking about. And there had been problems there. There had been problems in the pastor's life, and it caused a lot of problems. And this young man had been the youth pastor, but not only the youth pastor, it was his uncle. Mm-hmm. And in the course of all of the, 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 the going on and what all that, the newspapers and the media, he, well-known church, well-known name in the community. And I don't really know what all the problems were, but he got drug into it because of identification. Yeah. Just because he was related and because he was on staff. And he, it, it, it was so hard that he had to leave. He had to resign and leave. And he was in between, not knowing what he was going to do. And I, could, and I didn't know him. I'd never met him, never spoken to him. But I'd seen his picture in the news. And I could see the consternation and the hurt on his face. And I just, knowing how that we had been treated by some, I made it a point, and, it, and he was kind of like nobody was giving him the time of day. They were just, these other preachers were just ignoring him. And I just got up, and I walked over, knelt beside him, tapped him on the shoulder, he turned and looked at me, and I said, I don't know you, we've never met, but I just want to tell you, I love you. And I, when I did that, he broke, and he was six foot four. <laughs> had been an athlete in college, Georgia Tech. He broke and began to weep. Isn't that what Christians are supposed to be? Amen. We don't know the ins and outs. We have to leave that door. So show mercy. Well, Pastor Donnie, didn't Jesus teach us to show mercy? When the disciples asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Part of what he taught them, and you see this in Matthew chapter 6, I believe it's around verse 13. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Yeah, mercy and forgiveness go hand in they hand. They go hand in hand. You can't receive it till we give it. Exactly. And you know, if you want mercy, give mercy. Amen. 
at peace. Uh, there are two types of peace in the life of the child of God. One is justifying peace. Every single one of you sitting here and every one of you watching, the very fact that if you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, every one of us has justifying peace. But sanctifying peace is, a sec- is something else totally. And this is what Jude is talking about here, sanctifying peace. Sanctifying peace is really hard to define, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, the life of the believer, to bring us to a place that, that in the midst of life's difficulties, in the midst of the tribulation and the storms of life, there is peace, the peace of the heart. And Unfortunately, not everybody in the church has sanctifying peace because sanctifying peace is all tied in to the sanctification process, how we live for God. And since so much of the church, they don't know how to live for God, they don't have this sanctifying peace. And the only way you can have that sanctifying peace and, and, well, you you know, I used your, 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 uh, the little thing you brought yes, up. Yes, Give that to us real quick. Well, it's the, it, what we, if they want to put it up, it's the um, uh, defeated Christian living and victorious Christian living. But it deals with the object of faith. Or let me, let me start again. It deals with the focus first, then moves to the object of faith, then goes to the power source, and then goes to the result. For victory... Uh, the focus has to be on Jesus Christ, who he is, and what he's done. When the person and the believer really studies out in Scripture who he is and what he's done, the object of their faith will become the finished work of Christ, what Christ has done for us on the cross. When your faith is residing in God's provision, the work of the Holy Spirit now is a nonstop entity in the heart and life of that individual. And he's able to provide grace for us. The end result of that is sin shall not have dominion over you or victory. And that's the process. The point I wanted to make uh, in this is that when you are allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life and your focus is correct, the object of your faith is correct, sanctifying peace will always come. Yeah. If I might quote uh, Paul, please, from Romans chapter 5 and verse 2, it's the perfect definition. Uh, Verse 1 of Romans 5 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is justifying peace. But verse 2 gives us sanctifying peace and gives us a definition. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So this piece that we're talking about is the result of grace equipping us to stand uh, no matter what we go through uh, as a result of properly centered faith. And it brings peace. Yeah. It brings peace. Then he said love, and that is agape love, be multiplied. And the whole idea in that statement is, is that this should be these three these triple attributes should be working and multiplying on an ongoing basis in our lives. In other words, mercy is just multiplying. Yeah. Peace is multiplying. The love of God is multiplying in our hearts and be shed abroad toward others. Uh, verse 3 gets us into the heart and the reason why Jude wrote this book. Uh, Beloved, when I gave all diligence... A compulsion generated by the Holy Spirit. To write unto you of the common salvation. He had at first thought to write an epistle similar to Romans. But the Holy Spirit, although the author of the compulsion, did not lead in this direction. It was needful for me to write unto you. The implication is that whatever was to be written had to be written at once and could not be prepared for at leisure. And exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Refers to the fact that the saints must defend the doctrines of Christianity with intense effort. Which was once delivered unto the saints. Refers to the fact that no other faith will be given. The idea is that God gave the Christian doctrines to the saints as a deposit of truth to be guarded. 
The whole idea of this the particular verse, what Jude is saying here, he had set out to write a letter, an epistle, but it was not what he wrote eventually. He set out to write, when he said the common salvation, to write something along the lines of the book of Romans, talking about salvation, how one is saved, what Jesus Christ did to atone for sin. But as he would sit down to write, the Holy Spirit right. moved upon him in such a strong way. And what we have here, we see the work of the Holy Spirit in leading him and in giving direction. He had leading to write a letter. His idea was to write, as I said, something similar to the book of Romans. But the Holy Spirit moved upon him to address a problem that was becoming prevalent in the church today. Now that speaks of direction. Yeah. So that tells us the Holy Spirit wants to work in our life, first of all, to lead us and then to give us direction, to show us what to do and then how to do it. And so he gets direction from the Lord and uh, he said, it was needful me to write unto you. That word needful, the idea in the Greek is that the Holy Spirit compelled him is this if, as if the Holy Spirit came down, took him by the shoulders, and pushed him into a direction. No, this is what I need done. And the purpose of that writing was to exhort, that was to warn, that we should earnestly contend. That word earnestly contend is very interesting in that it, it, it speaks of the sporting events in the Roman Empire of that day, that when they would run a race, whether it was the Greeks or the Romans, it all meant the same. They, they just didn't run, but they would run and run and push themselves until they would agonize. I mean, they would leave nothing left. They would literally, sometimes their heart would explode because they would run so hard with the goal to win. Actually, this term, earnestly contend, uh, is where we get the uh, our word agony, yes. that agony. And so the Holy Spirit moves on him and tells him, you're to tell the church that they are to agonize. They are to fight. They are to struggle, if you will. And it will be a struggle to stand up for truth. But they must not waver when it comes to to the faith that I have established. Yes, yes, now I want you to understand something. This is not an admonition just to preachers. But every single one of you have been called by God and those of you by television have been called by God to contend for the faith. Amen. Now what does that mean? It means standing up for truth. Right. Yes. It means not letting error go by when you have an opportunity to set the record straight, if you will. Doesn't mean to be contentious. Doesn't mean to be mean. Though sometimes in standing for truth, there will be contention right. and there will be hostility. But he is saying that what God has given us is so important and mm -hmm. so precious that Satan is sending in individuals that will come in to pervert the truth, right. to lead the people of God away. And we as believers who know the truth, whether you're the pastor, whether you're a layman sitting in the pew, when we know the truth, we must not allow anyone to pervert the truth when we have an opportunity to set it straight. Yes. Now, yes. You, now, when you do that, you're not going to win friends, but you might save souls. Amen. Amen. Hello? Yes. You might save souls. And, and many times, people just parrot or what they, they believe what they've been told. And really, when it gets right down to it, because of television... When you talk to a lot of Christians, you'll find that they have borrowed a little bit from here, a little bit from here, and a little bit from here, and they've got spiritual gumbo. And it's just an all, just an all, just all this stuff thrown together, but there's no organization, there's no structure. And you have to, and when they start 
repeating things or doing things that are contrary to the Word of God, we as a believer, we have to stand up for truth and say, listen, hey, I'm sorry, but that's not right. Right. That's not right. Mm -hmm. And we bring them back to the Word. God has called every one of you to be a minister. I didn't say a preacher, but I said a minister. Yes. And you minister the God, the more you know, what is the word? Of God? You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And the more truth you know, the more truth you can give to those in the church that are not. You know, I'm looking at this brother right here on the second row. He's, he's been fellowshipping here for the last few months. He's come out of the United Methodist Church and he's now part of the global Methodist Church that split away. And when they had that major meeting a couple of years ago in their convention, and they were wanting to endorse homosexuality, lesbianism, to ordain homosexuals, to ordain lesbians, embracing transgenderism and all these other things, I was watching a video, and I watched an African bishop from the Methodist church step up and all these other people had gotten up that were pro, had gotten, and not a one of them had brought the Word of God into it. We, 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 we're facing a changing society. We have to be diverse. We have to be open. And this African bishop stepped up and never once addressed society, never once addressed what this culture was doing, but instead he opened up the Word of God. And he began to refute everything they said by the word of God. And it stopped everything in its tracks. This one man, yeah. this one man stopped that vote. Now, eventually it went through. But what's happened since then is over 5,000 Methodist churches have said, we are not going that way. We're going to stand for the word of God. We're going to do what the Bible says. And that's earnestly contending for the faith. Right. You know, all of us, when I say all of us, I'm speaking of Papa, you, Mimi, myself. We've all had to take stands in certain regards on certain issues. And e each time that each one of us had to take a specific stand to contend for the faith, it did cause a lot of contention. But at the same time, the people that were either brought to Christ, brought out of that circumstance or whatever that issue was, far outweighs the contention. And I'll never forget the time when I was in North Carolina at a youth convention. And I was asked to go. I did not know who the pastor was, but I was invited. And I went. And so I was, I was sitting on, in the... I guess it was like a Longhorn Steakhouse or something like that with the pastor and the youth pastor. I asked for an order of service. Well, the youth pastor said, we've got a great thing. We've got a DJ. We've got a rapper. We've got dancers. We've got all this stuff that's happening before the service. And I said, you know I preach against all of that. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, oh, I think you're going to like it. And I'm like, I, we'll see about that. Well, whenever I got there, it's exactly what he said. It had all of that. The lights were off. It was, it, was, it was very demonic. And I'll never forget, there was an older gentleman that was there. He was one of the ushers. And he said, he said, Brother Gabe, I don't like any of this. It's not my generation. It's not my era. I don't like it. I don't know why that I don't like it, but do you like it? I said, no, I don't. And he said, is there anything we can do about it? And I said, well, I'm by myself. But in, this, in, in my heart, the Lord began to deal with me and said, you need to go down and stop this. And I began to argue with the Lord and said, Lord, this is, that's not, I'm by myself. There's nobody here with me. I don't have a Keith with me. I don't have anybody else with, I am by myself. And the Lord said, you need to go down and stop it. And so I made a deal with God. I said, God, if the youth pastor comes up here with a microphone, I will go and stop it. It wasn't five seconds later. That youth pastor walks up, knocks on the door with the microphone and looks at me. He says, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, 
Give me the microphone, I'll handle it. I walk down onto the stage and I put my hand on that, that rapper's shoulder, moved him back, and it was like a hush filled that room. 400 young people got up and walked out. There was about 800 of them there. Half of them walked out, and they were about ready to storm back in to cause a riot because I stopped the whole concert. But whenever I preached a short message after that, and I told the people, what you're seeing is ungodly, what you're seeing is not right, what you're seeing is not scriptural. And I said, I think we need to all stand up and sing a little chorus entitled, Oh, the Blood of Jesus. And when that happened, you can feel the spirit change. And when I preached that short message and I gave an altar call, that altar was flooded with young people as they came forward to say yes to Jesus. Now, I didn't make friends and I was never invited back to that church. But what, I was, what I'm trying to say is when, when you have to take a stand for what's right, it might cost you, but you'll gain more in the long run. Right. You'll gain more in the long run. Amen. Absolutely. Yeah. Donnie, I love this statement. I'll read it to you. Uh, in speaking about a definition for earnestly contending, the intensity of the defense must be adjusted to the intensity of the opposition. Yeah, you go. The intensity of your defense has to be adjusted to the intensity of the opposition. You can't let the opposition come in and push everything that God has created and done for salvation away. So our re response then to contending for the faith has to be as equally strong as the intention of the enemy to steal our faith. And that's, that's strong. You know, Lauren, we dealt uh, before camp meeting. We were faced with this on Mother's Program. We didn't intend to do it, but uh, something came up about alcohol. And I've always, you know, I've known that there are a lot of Christians, so-called Christians out there, that want to promote alcohol. They're drinking. And we are 100% against that. But I... We got over a two or three day period, several emails. I mean, they were fighting mad, wanting to defend their alcohol use. I mean, and I don't mean just little, e I mean, emails two and three pages long. You know, all oh, the water that the Lord turned into wine, it was alcoholic wine. There's nothing wrong with relieving the stress at the end of a day, you know. And they were just going on and on and on. One of them even wrote, and this is how, when, you, when, you, when you're wrong and you're trying to defend something, you get bizarre in the things you come up yeah. with. Because one of them sent, and this is the truth, that of course it was alcoholic wine that Jesus at the wedding feast of Cana, because if he would have turned it into grape juice, everybody would have gone into a sugar o uh, overdose. <laughs> And I'm sitting there like they didn't have processed sugar in Bible days. Yeah. But anyway, but the point I'm making is that is I took a stand. If you're going to be that strong about it, I'm going to be ten times stronger right. exactly. on the other end. Right. Yeah, the, we were talking about it today even on your dad's program uh, on the message of the cross in Ephesians 5 and 18. Paul warns. Don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess or what that which produces debauchery. The idea is don't be, because alcohol at any level enters the bloodstream and impacts every single aspect of the human being, how they, how they are able to evaluate, how are they, how they able to react, respond, everything. And Paul says, don't do that. Instead, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we have the Spirit of God available to us today to meet every need. So just coming to me and telling me that uh, we do this because we like it, honestly, that's why people drink. They like the feeling of intoxication that it provides. And anybody that says that's not the reason isn't telling the truth. Uh, but the Bible tells us plainly, we should want the influence of the Spirit far more and more, far more continuous than any other drug Amen. that is available to us, whether it's pot or whether it's alcohol. We'll have to deal with that in the church soon, too. Well, as long as one of us is in charge of this church, 
we're going to take a stand for what is right, and we're going to take a stand against what is wrong. And if if somebody feels like they have to have wine to de-stress, they've just got one problem. They truly don't understand the cross and what Jesus did for us to help us de-stress. And the church, as it begins to compromise on these measures, it was Charles Spurgeon over a hundred years ago who made the comment, the devil knows well that one devil in the church can do more than a thousand outside its boundaries. So they began to infiltrate the church to get us to compromise on seemingly harmless things. But the problem is, is once you start compromising, there is no end. Well, Spurgeon called it the downward spiral. We're running out of time. I want to look at, he said, earnestly contend for what? The faith. Yes. And that, that idea of that word faith is that there has been a specific faith given. There is not five ways, ten ways, fourteen ways. There's only one way of salvation. It's what the Bible has laid out. And he said, and he, he, he confirms that when he says, which was once delivered unto the saint, saints, meaning that we have the message. Right. We have the truth. There is no more revelation to come. There's no such thing as new revelation. Everything the Lord wants us to know is found in this book yes. from Genesis yes. to Revelation. It's been once delivered. It is the faith and it is the only faith that will save, that will heal, that will deliver, that will see bondages broken. And it's the only faith worth preaching and it's the only faith worth dying for. Amen. And it is worth dying for. All right, next week we'll pick up with the, with the false teachers that were coming in to the church. I think we're going to enjoy this little study of the book of Jude. Stand to your feet tonight and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for all of your goodness and your mercy. Just lift your hands. Just lift your hands all over this building and begin to worship Him and thank Him. Lord, we thank you tonight. May we ever be beacons of light in this darkness. May in our life, our actions, and our words, may we contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Let us be defenders of the faith in every opportunity that we have. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. And everybody said amen and amen. Turn around, greet somebody, hug their necks. We'll see you Sunday morning. We are able to go up. hope you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, Sun Life Radio, online at sunlifetv.com, and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call 1-800-288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network.